I want to begin this morning by telling you the story of a minister by the name of Den Guptel. And the seeds that were planted in him by his father, his family, and his friends. These are his words. It was the end of August in 1979. I was a 19-year-old fisherman on the Herring Saner Raleigh 2 out of Pospebiac, Quebec. I probably butchered that, but that's okay. Don't ask why a crew from St. John and Grand Manon were crewing a saner from Quebec. It's a long story. We had spent the summer in the Bay of Fundy, and that season was over. So we had returned to Quebec to fish in the Gaspe before heading to Newfoundland for the fall. The herring had been running. And we were excited about our prospects when we received word that the Department of Fisheries had cut the quota in that area for a week. That seemed to be the story of the summer. If we had market, we had no fish. If we had fish, we had no market. We were told that the restrictions would be lifted in a week or so, and we decided to go home for that week. On Sunday, September 2nd, my best friend invited me to attend church with him, actually pestered me, nagged me, cajoled me, would be more accurate, but whatever. And so that Sunday evening, I found myself at First Wesleyan Church in St. John, New Brunswick. The second time I had been in a church service in seven years. The pastor, Jack McKenzie, was on vacation. And a student from Bethany Bible College, Bob Coulette, was filling in for him. I don't recall what Bob preached on that night, but at the end of the service, I found myself committing my life to Christ and feeling a call to full-time ministry. And it was completely unexpected. When I told people that I had become a Christian and that I was going to go to Bible college, they looked at me like I had said I had become a Martian. There was no context. I wasn't a church goer. I had expressed absolutely no interest in spiritual things. I wasn't seeking God. At 19, if anything, I was a hedonist, which is defined in the Collins English Dictionary as... Someone who believes that having pleasure is the most important thing in life. My philosophy was when I got too old for wine, women, and song, I'd give up singing. Although if you asked me, I probably wouldn't have de defined myself thus, because as Mason Cooley once said, the philosophy of hedonism means little to lovers of pleasure. They have no inclination to read philosophy or to write it. So while I may not have identified myself as thus, I was a hedonist. But regardless of my philosophy of life, most people who knew me would say that my life took a 180 degree turn that night, and that it was completely unexpected. Jesus told his listeners in Mark chapter 4, verse 27, night and day while he, the farmer, is asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and grows, and he does not understand how it happens. It is a mystery. But still the farmer continues to plant. 
year upon year, even if he doesn't completely understand how it happens. All he knows is that it does happen. And in Mark chapter 4, verse 26, Jesus also said, The kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters seed on the ground. The first thing that we note is that the ground was prepared. I know that it doesn't say that the ground was prepared in that passage, but it does say that the man was a farmer. I'm not a farmer. I'm only a small-scale gardener, gardener, but I know enough to know that one doesn't simply go out and spread seed on the soil that hasn't been prepared and then wonder why the seeds don't sprout and grow. In fact, when preparing my small garden every year to plant those vegetable seeds, I first have to prepare the soil before I actually put the seeds in the dirt. And you prepare the soil by pulling out those rocks. We all know Connecticut likes to grow rocks. Break up the soil, tear out the weeds. We add in the fertilizer and then eventually the soil is ready enough for us to be able to put the seeds in. The hero of our story might have pulled the rocks out by hand in our biblical passages that we read this morning. He might have tilled the ground with a hoe and mixed in manure from his animals. Perhaps if he was a successful farmer with a lot of land, he might have even used a donkey or a pair of oxen to pull a plow and prepare that soil. But regardless of the how, we have to assume that since he was a farmer, that he took the time to prepare that soil. He understood that in order for the seed to grow, there would need to be work done before those seeds were ever planted. And if you weren't around for the preparation of the soil, you might watch the farmer sowing his seed and not realize all of the work that had already gone into that process. Very seldom do we hear about a person who has never heard the gospel suddenly embrace those claims of Christ. The day that I became a Christ follower, nearest I can recollect, I was about eight. It was the first time I was aware of God's presence with me. I remember my parents having bedtime prayers with me when I was little. I remember as a child going to Sunday school at Kingswood Baptist Church in Ball, Louisiana. I remember going to vacation Bible school. And I remember the bus from the Pentecostal church coming round to pick me and my sister up for Sunday school in the summertime. Then in my early teens, I remember going to youth group. And while those events didn't seem to make a major difference in my life, the soil along the way was being prepared. Solomon tells us in Proverbs 22, verse 6, Direct your children onto the right path, and when they are older, they will not leave it. Sometimes we wonder why. When we don't see immediate fruit, but the soil is being prepared, folks. In the parable, the chances of the seed germinating and growing would have been drastically reduced if the farmer hadn't taken the time to prepare the soil in advance. And the chance of a person coming to faith is exponentially increased if the soil is prepared when they are young. But even when not... I am here to tell you, as in the case of my own life, don't give up on that person you love. To paraphrase Solomon, do your best when they are young 
and pray for the best when they are older. When it wasn't enough that the farmer had prepared the soil, there is something else that we need to consider that must take place. And that is the seed must be sown. If the farmer had prepared the soil but never planted anything, all of his work would have been in vain. The purpose of preparing the soil is to plant the seed. Different times throughout the Gospels, Jesus uses seeds as an illustrative device. And the seed represents an invitation to accept the grace of Jesus. An invitation to join the kingdom of God. Now we know that there are different ways to plant a seed. Sometimes in the spring we have our lawns overseeded using broadcast spreaders to scatter that seed about. But in the case of my garden, when I plant my vegetable seeds, I have to plant each and every one of them individually. But regardless of how those seeds are planted, they must be planted before they can grow. In the story of Din Guptil, he mentions that the night he became a Christian, he didn't really remember what the preacher said except for a sermon illustration that he used. Din remembered that illustration. And this has been a valuable lesson for me as a preacher. Sermon illustrations are important because sometimes they might be the only thing a person remembers out of that service. And Din said that the seed that was sown in him came by way of his best friend who had been a believer, who had become a believer the year before. He also mentioned his father and his family as planters of seeds. He talked about how his friend had shared the gospel with him several times before, as did his family without success. Den said he brushed them off and told them maybe later. Said that he would think about it, but he really wasn't all that interested. Still, his friends and his family didn't quit. God's word says to us, it promises us in Isaiah 55 verse 11, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. Meaning, God sends out his word and it always produces fruit. Think about that, folks. Not always in our time, God's time. God says it will accomplish all that I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Den's friend believed that if he kept sowing those seeds, then eventually some of it would take. There is another great story told about John Wesley's mother, Susanna, she and her husband, Samuel, had 19 children, 10 of whom lived. And she homeschooled all 10 of those children. Boys and girls learned to read and write as well as do mathematics, Greek, and Latin, and an, and an appreciation for the classics. She didn't think a child should have lessons until they turned five. But the day that they turned five, their lessons began. Beginning with learning their alphabet, which she expected them to learn on that very first day, and eight of her ch children actually went on to learn the alphabet on that first day. The story is that her husband had the curiosity to sit by one day and count 
while she repeated the same lessons to one particular child over and over and over. I wonder at your patience, he said. You have told that child 20 times that very same thing. Yes, she answered. And if I had satisfied myself by mentioning it only 19 times, I should have lost all my labor because it was the 20th time that crowned it. In the same way, if Den's friend had quit telling him about Jesus after that first or third or fifth or hundredth time, I wonder what would have happened. Instead, he was faithful, and that night when he invited Din to church once again, instead of coming up with an excuse, Din accepted. And that night, Bob preached and extended an invitation to come forward and to accept Christ, and Din didn't go forward. And the service finished, and the people were leaving. And Den's friend looked, up, looked over at him and asked, Do you want to go forward and talk to God about becoming a Christian? And Den said, Yes. What if Den's friend hadn't asked him? What if he had thought, Well, he had the chance and he didn't take it, and there's always next time? What if Den's friend hadn't asked? The soil had been prepared and the seed had been sown. And there's more to the story of the seed than simply the preparation of that soil and the sowing of that seed. Let's go back to that story in Mark chapter 4 verses 26 and 28. Where Jesus says the kingdom of God is like a farmer who scatters the seed on the ground. Night and day, while he's asleep or awake, the seed sprouts and it grows, but he does not understand how it happens. The earth produces the crops on its own. First, a leaf blade pushes through. Then the heads of the wheat are formed, and finally the grain ripens. It's here that we find out that stuff happens. Between the sowing and the reaping, Stuff happens. In this case, of course, it was good stuff, right? The sun shone. It rained. The seed grew. Our first summer garden here in Connecticut, the sun shone. And the rain was just right. And we had a bumper crop of vegetables. We had more zucchini than I have ever seen before in my life. For a crop to grow, it needs that sunshine. It needs that rain. And sometimes we get bummed out when the rain is lacking. Remember a few years back when we didn't get enough rain and we were in a drought? I remember people's wells were running dry. And I can remember me and Brandon actually going down to the pond a little ways down the road and filling up those five-gallon buckets and loading them up in his truck just to save those few little veggies that we had that year. If the farmer had prepared the soil and planted the seed and the summer had turned into a drought or even perhaps the wettest summer, sometimes we have really wet summers, then there might not have been any harvest at all. And the farmer has absolutely no control over either one of those things. You know, the ground can be prepared and the seed can be sown. And sometimes there still doesn't seem to be any results. During those years before I became a Christ follower, there were things that were happening behind the scenes that I didn't know about. And probably wouldn't have appreciated if I did know about them. For one thing, I was on a number of prayer lists. My mama and my nanny were saying prayers over me that I, I only found out about years later 
when my mama told me how she used to pray over me that I would come to know the Lord and that I would go on to do something, his plan, in, regarding his plan for my life. How she prayed that my heart would turn to God and that I would follow him with everything that I am. Den said the change I saw evidenced in the life of my best friend that year was helping that seed to grow in me. He said he remembered going to Sussex one night to visit his friend at a college And then on the way home, he stopped at the house of his favorite auntie, who was a believer. And Dan told her, I don't understand it. I have a good job. I have a nice car. Everything I can ask for. And yet I'm miserable. And my friend doesn't have a thing to his name. And he's happy. To which Den's auntie replied, maybe you need what he has. To which Den said, no, I'm pretty sure that's not it. And that year, Den said he didn't run into any Christians who acted like jerks. And God began to work in his heart. That was the year Den said he was introduced to both Jesus Christ, superstar, and God's spell. Tells you about how long ago this story happened. And they presented Jesus to him in a way that spoke to him. And he said he knows there are all kinds of theological problems with superstar and God's spell. But in 1979, all he knew was that they showed him a Jesus that he kind of liked. And the mystery is that the seed that was sown by his best friend was watered and nurtured by all kinds of different things. The farmer didn't understand all the things that made the seed grow, and he knew that he couldn't control everything like the sun and the rain. But there were things that he could control. He could pull weeds, and he could work at keeping the things from eating the plants. If need be, he might have even been able to go get that water and water them if there wasn't enough rain. When we have shared the gospel with people, we can never completely understand what happens in their hearts. We don't know their history and their baggage a lot of times that they might carry. Sometimes we do know. But we can do our part to not be jerks and to show them the love of Christ and to allow God to do his part. Mark 4, 29 says, And as soon as the grain is ready, the farmer comes and harvests it with a sickle, for the harvest time has come. And then comes the harvest. At the end of the day, the farmer harvested what he had sown, and it wasn't a one-to-one process. Instead, that one seed produced a plant that had many seeds. Once Den went on to become a minister, and he moved into teaching ministry, he once said, one time when I was teaching, I was asked by one of my students, no, I asked my students, what an apple seed was supposed to produce. And the student said apples, to which I said, no, an apple seed doesn't produce an apple. It produces an apple tree, which in turn produces an apple orchard. There is also a warning that Paul gives to the Galatians church that we find is also a promise to us. Galatians 6 verse 7 says, Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. The warning, of course, is that bad behavior and bad choices result in bad consequences. But the promise, of course, is that we will always harvest whatever it is that we plant.
And we're always planting, folks. The kingdom of God exists because the ground was prepared, seeds were planted, and eventually believers were harvested. And not just believers. Remember, the fruit of the apple seed isn't just an apple. It's an apple tree and eventually an apple orchard. The fruit of the seed that Den's friend planted wasn't just a Christian. It was 38 years of ministry. It was each person that Den would go on to lead to the Lord, either personally or through preaching. And it was each person that they in turn would have led to the Lord. I want you to think about that for a moment, folks. Maybe you're sitting there saying, so what? What does it have to do with me? Well, Jesus told those who followed him 2,000 years ago in Luke chapter 6, verses 43 and 44, a good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. Figs never grow on thorn bushes and grapes don't grow on bramble bushes either. It's the same way today. Trees are still identified by their fruit. Part of their fruit is their seed. Each one of you will go on to plant seeds of some kind. And while you might not have control over what happens once you sow that seed, or when it happens, how it happens, you will choose what type of seed you are going to sow. And after you sow the seed, it's simple. We all have tasks. Love God. Love others. Don't be a jerk. God speaking through the prophet Hosea tells us in Hosea 10 verse 12, Plant the good seeds of righteousness and you will harvest a crop of love. So let me leave you with the words of Paul to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Never underestimate the power of a seed in the hands of our Almighty God. I'm living proof. Amen. Let us stand and sing our closing hymn today, Faith of a Mustard Seed.